And you can turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 with me this morning. And I am just going to give a disclaimer at the beginning of this message. Um, this was not the message that I was planning on preaching this morning. Um, it was one of those things where God just kind of told me, yeah, this is what you're doing instead, which is always fun for the pastor. Um, and, and so um, it was probably Saturday or actually Friday that I realized, you know, I'm teaching a different message than I planned on. So this message is going to come to you fresh out of the box. It's probably going to have a lot of duct tape on it and um, other things, uh, you know, so it's not real polished or anything like that, but you know, this is what we get. And I, I just feel like God has something for us this morning. But this, kind of, this whole thing was kind of birthed through um, the pastor's conference. As Jesse and Jason and I went, um, we had an awesome time just hearing from the Lord, just, um, just having the Lord speak to our hearts about um, and what He wants to do for our church. And, you know, and, and um, you know, just a good time with those guys. Um, spend about 32 hours um, plus in the car with Jesse and Jason, which was fun, uh, mostly. Uh, even the 45-minute detour to see White, White Horse Mountain was kind of fun when Jesse took us um, on the wrong turn, and we just kept going, and, and finally, you know, he, he actually, to his credit, he's the one who said, hey, I think we're going the wrong way. And um, I'm like, yeah, I think we are. And so anyway, we ended up um, turning around and going back, but it was a pretty view. Um, but the whole thing was kind of interesting. I think Jason came back um, from this conference as a charismatic um, or, or maybe, we, we guess we could call him a pneumatic, I don't know. Somebody, we decided to use something like that. And um, it was a good time. But I, I admit, as going to this conference, that it was a bit apprehensive because, um, you know, we are at a, a kind of a transitional phase within our movement. And it's transitional because um, for the first time, we're a brand new movement. I mean, we've only been around since the late 60s, early 70s is when Calvary Chapel really started and, and God always um, does that when he's going to do something um, to, to start something he always picks a man which in this case he picked Chuck Smith and Chuck didn't plan it he didn't you know wasn't what his goals were or anything but God took Chuck and he he discipled a bunch of young men who were hippies at that time and part of the Jesus movement and he sent them out um, throughout you know California and then throughout the world and, and now Calvary Chapel is all over the world over 3,000 churches and growing every year I think they planted 250 churches last year were planted through Calvary Chapel and a lot of just upstarts that aren't official Calvary chapels yet there are just little Bible studies everywhere um, right now and so God is doing something within our movement but but Chuck passed away last year and so Pastor Chuck passing and now going to the conference for the first time without Chuck, I was a little bit apprehensive about where our movement would fall. And, um, and I, I, candidly, I was just kind of concerned that it would move through those specific transitions that movements do. It starts with a man, and it grows into a movement of God, and that movement then in, invariably, and we see this throughout church history, turns into a machine, and that machine um, then becomes a monument, or should we say a mausoleum, a relic of the past that people look back, and some people are still clinging to the, the system, but, but it's just mostly the elderly, and it's just dying as the people die. And, and that, that happens with movements. And, you know, and so with Chuck being gone, you know, a lot of people said, well, Calvary Chapel is going to change its face, and everything is going to change. And so I was a little bit apprehensive. The, the conference was at a different location. It was at Calvary Costa Mesa instead of at Marietta. And they said, well, it's because we're inviting more guys who are planning to plant churches this year. And, you know, you wonder about all that stuff. But I, I went, and I have to say that I was very, very pleased. Not only did God confirm a lot of things in my heart about our fellowship and the direction that we've been going, just encouraging, 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 but also um, to see that, that nobody's grabbing for power and they're just saying, hey, stay the course. You know, God did this work. And, and in every church, as God sends a guy out, that becomes its own movement in itself. As God raises somebody up and they, by faith they go out and they step out and plant a church, it's, it's not going to be controlled by the big church because there is no big church in Calvary Chapel. Every church is independent and autonomous. And, and I suppose that's what I was scared of. They were going to be like, well, we just need to become a denomination so that we can keep control of the guys who go wacky and all of that and then it's it begins to be controlled by somebody in another place and all of a sudden we become a denomination and the spirit is just pushed out you know and that's that's what happens a lot of times but that's not happening and i was really pleased to see that 
you know, they, that they continue to say, you know, we need to love all Christians as, as believers in Jesus Christ and, and pastors. We need to realize that there are more people than just Calvary Chapel people, that the body of Christ is huge. And we need to love all of those people and, and, and work together hand in hand with them. But having said that, they also are very clear that we need to stay the course, that we need to hold fast to the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to work within us and in our churches to determine what that church is supposed to look like and, and the direction to be remain flexible to the Spirit and allow the Spirit to move the church with the culture, not in the doctrinal sense, you know, we want to stick firm to the Word, but allow the, the feel and the music and the, you know, the orthopraxy of the way we do church to be fluid with the, the moving of the Holy Spirit and, and to continue to be a youth-driven movement. We always have to be reaching the youth. We always have to be reaching the youth. And that means that some of us, you know, I mean, as I get older, there's certain styles of music I'm going to like, but, you know, we got to continue to keep things fresh as the worship team is up here. And, and you know, just everything has to remain that way relevant to the culture. And, and I think, you know, as we look around, you see um, young and old here. And that's a beautiful thing. That's exactly how a church should be. And so just encouraged, um, very, very encouraged. And, and so... As we were coming back, I was putting together my message um, that I had been preparing before in Acts chapter 7, and i um, ex excited to do that, but you know, on my way back, as we were driving back, I'm, I had my computer open in, in the front seat, and Jesse's driving, so it's kind of hard to concentrate on the computer. You know, he's a pretty good driver. He drove, he drove for 16, well, because of the detour, 17 hours straight, um, you know, without even, you know, just the whole time, so he's a good driver. Um, and... I couldn't focus on what I was supposed to be doing. I'm just looking at my past and it just wasn't speaking to me. And I really just felt, felt like God was telling me, I want you to speak on the topic of go. I, want, I have a message for you. And I just kept ignoring that. You know how you just ignore the Holy Spirit? I'm just like, you know, don't leave me alone. I have my plans. Leave me alone. But here it is. And so by God's grace, you know, duct tape and all, here we go. Um, here's my message. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3 if you haven't already turned there. I think I told you to turn now already. In the book of Revelation, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. And as he's writing to these churches, he's giving them a report card. And that report card is basically saying, hey, this is what I love about you. This is what I don't like about you. This is um, what needs to change. And, and this is what you need to do to get back to where you need to be. And so there's exhortation, there's encouragement, there's comfort, there's all these things um, that he gives to each of the churches. Some are missing some elements. Um, but he's giving them, basically, this is what I see when I look at you. And, and as we see this, we're looking at Revelation chapter 3, and of course we're talking about the church of Philadelphia, and he says this to them. He says, verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, <clears throat> and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. I've kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, I'm not going, going to be presumptuous and say, Calvary Chapel Emmett, is the Church of Philadelphia, or we're, we're much like it, or somehow that's how God sees us, because I think that we have a lot of growing to do, but I also see um, that this specific passage, and I also feel like this specific passage is what God is speaking to us right now. <clears throat> and, and what he says here, he says, I've set before you this open door, and that's kind of what I'm seeing um, for our church, is we have these open doors that God has set before us. But he also encouraged them. He says, this is why I've opened doors for you, for you have a little strength. And, I, you know, thinking of our church, you know, we don't have great wealth. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> not too long ago, this building was so ugly that most people just passed it by and wouldn't even try to come to church here because it just was so unsightly. And it's still not real functional. I mean, we don't have great function here. But you guys put up with it. You know, a lot of people come and put up with it, and that's awesome, you know. And we don't have great power or influence. And yet what we do have, because <coughs> of where we've been and what we've seen God do, we do have faith. We believe that he is our strength. And I think that that's what he's saying when he says you have a little strength. Because Jesus, of course, says my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so recognizing that we don't have a whole lot of power or influence or a lot of wealth, we realize that Jesus is what we have to look to. And we know and we believe and we've seen where God guides, God provides, right? We've seen that the Spirit leads us and we step out in faith, in ventures of faith, and the Lord provides for us along the way. We've seen that. 
And so as a church, we have a little strength. We could have more faith, and hopefully we will, but right now, we have a little faith, and we have a little strength. He also says, you've kept my word. And um, the word kept here in its noun form actually means warden, like of a prison, you know, locked down. In its verb form, it means to protect, it means to, <clears throat> to guard. And of course, that would imply also obedience. But we um, are focused on keeping God's word. And that's, that's what we do, just through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we go through God's word, like it or not, and sometimes not, you know, honestly, um, there's passages that we go through in the New Testament as we're going through, and the Old Testament as we just go through verse by verse. There's passages I would rather not teach because I know I'm going to get letters and people are going to complain about it because there's just difficult topics. But all we're doing is just turning the page, right? We're just turning the page and looking at the next thing that God says. And guess what? Sometimes, if you haven't figured this out yet, you will. Sometimes it offends. It offends me. I don't know that anybody can actually look at what God's Word and take it for what it says and not find it to be a little bit contrary to your flesh, right? And so, but we continue to keep His Word, to guard it, and to apply it to our lives. And Jesus said about His Word <clears throat> to the Father as He's praying for us in, in John chapter 17, He said, Sanctify them by your truth, your Word is true. And so as we look through God's Word and as we go through it verse by verse, it, it has a changing effect upon our hearts and on our minds, and it sanctifies us, which means to make holy. It makes us holy, it separates us for God. And so holy means is separate. <clears throat> of course, we know the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul, the mind, <clears throat> and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow and the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And that's what God's word does for us. It penetrates our soul. He also says, you've not denied my name. And this is um, kind of an interesting <coughs> thought. You haven't denied my name. What does that mean? <coughs> the word in the Greek for name, and, and actually in most um, languages, means more than just somebody's name, their given name, or their surname. Um, like Jesus being his, his first name. It means a lot more than that. Actually, it means authority. It can mean character. And that's why a lot of times their titles are included in their name, like Simon the Zealot. He was zealous for the Roman or for the Jewish, um, government, or Jewish uh, people against the Roman government. And so he was called Simon the Zealot. Um, Jesus of Nazareth. He was from Nazareth. And so they give him that name. But in this context, it's talking about authority. So you have not denied my authority. And so what is Jesus's authority? I think this is important. And I think it's all important when it comes to not only salvation, but also what we believe to be true about Jesus Christ. What is what does that mean? You have not denied my name. In John chapter 3 verse 16 it says, "For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life." Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not, wait, I think I skipped the verse, but anyway, verse 18 says, those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Again, they're condemned because they haven't believed in his name. Now, what is his name? What does that mean in terms of his authority? Well, Matthew chapter 1, I believe it's in verse 18, no, verse 23, says, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 says, behold, <clears throat> the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so his name, his authority is that he is God with us. And we also see that in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, where it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. <clears throat> of course, the deity of Christ isn't a mystery throughout the Bible. <coughs> Pardon me. It is pretty clear. Even in John chapter 1 and verse 1, it tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, <clears throat> and the Word was God. And skipping down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so Jesus is God 
in the flesh. His authority is that He is God. And because He is God in the flesh, He is also Lord, which means Master, right? And that's, what, that's how we look at Him as Christians. We see Jesus is our Master, and He is to be obeyed. Of course, Philippians tells us this in Philippians 2.9. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted Him, Jesus, <clears throat> and given Him a name or an authority which is above every authority or name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so not only is He God, but He is Lord. He is Master of all. And then probably another important thing that we believe about His name is that His name or His authority is the only source in all the universe in wherever you look, He is the only source for salvation. There is salvation in no other place. Of course, Acts 4.12 tells us this, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no man comes to the Father except through me. And so and we, could, we could do a study, a um, 10-week series on the subject of soritology or what it means to be saved or what salvation is. And yet, um, you know, Jesus is the source of that, right? And yet it's, simplis in, it's simple. It's, it's simplistic in, in um, how to describe what Jesus is as our Savior. And we're going to be talking about that next. So God, because of they believe these things, they have <clears throat> they kept His word. They haven't denied His name. He sends, sets before them an open door. And so too, I feel at this stage in our church, we also have an open door, and related specifically to the Great Commission. As we watched that video before, God's heart for a church, the local church, is to send missionaries. And to go, for some to go. And of course, Jesus tells us this in Matthew 28. And that's our text for today, officially. In Matthew 28, if you want to turn there. And of course, we know this is the Great Commission. <clears throat> what many people have called the Great Omission. Because <laughs> people don't obey it. But we um, have been given a charge by Jesus. In Matthew 8, 28, and starting in verse 18... Jesus came and spoke to the disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So there it is again, his authority. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so Jesus says to go into all the world, all, into all the earth, into every nation, and um, make disciples. Now, of course, in Mark 16, verse 15, he tells us that to go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? That's what he tells us. It's the same um, commission. He says, preach the gospel to every creature, meaning every person. <clears throat> and then, of course, those who receive are the ones that become disciples, which means students. Um, and now, this all this could be very. It's a lot. That is a lot of uh, a lot of Christianese there, isn't it? Preach the gospel to every creature. Um, you know, we hear that, and, and I think that that's intimidating to us because preaching the gospel is the job of the minister. Now, we've been talking about words, and I think words are important. And what these words mean is very important because it, it's not all that official. I think it's it's interesting to me that people grab onto words and they grab onto systems and they think that God is just so impressed by how accurately we try to do things, which I don't think is necessarily the case. You see, um, it, it tells us here we need to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you realize that that's actually an issue within the church? When you baptize somebody, you know, if you didn't say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when you baptize them, no good. That's what people will tell you. Well, I was baptized in the name of Jesus. In another place it says, baptized in the name of Jesus. 
Well, oh, not good enough because you have to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then you have the other group out there. Oh, if you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's no good. You have to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. I mean, really? And yet, what it really means is to be baptized in the authority. And don't we have the authority of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Don't we have the authority of the Son, Jesus, when we baptize somebody? Do we actually have to say those words? For your benefit, when I baptize you, I do say that. If you've been baptized by me, I say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yes, I do. Just because I know that somebody's going to come and say, oh, it wasn't any good. You know, it's just ridiculous. But just to, to not offend... You know, we feel like, oh, we have to say in Jesus' name, amen, or it doesn't get sent, right? You fall asleep in the middle of your email, or your email. You fall asleep in the middle of your email, or your prayer, and, and God's not going to hear it because you forgot to say in Jesus' name, amen, at the end. Really? No, you're praying in the authority of Jesus, right? Because you belong to him, not because you're, that's the send button. If you forgot to say it at the end, then, uh oh, it didn't go. I mean, come on, guys. We, we're, this, there's reality to all this stuff. It's not a, a system. And so when he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, he's not saying go into all the world and preach the gospel. He's saying, go into, into the whole world and tell them the good news. That's what that means. It's translated into English. Tell them the good news. Because it is good news. Right? And so that makes it a little easier to think about. Okay, well, I'm not going to preach the gospel. I'm going just to tell people the good news of what Jesus has done for me. To tell them what Jesus could do for them if they believe on him. It's just that simple. But I think that we have to define exactly what the gospel is, too, because, you know, that, there's a question about that as well. <clears throat> of course, we have to remember who Jesus is and, and what his authority is, right? That he is God. That he came as flesh. That he died on the cross for our sins. I love how David Beck, just I saw him out there, just remind me that he was talking to some guy. Jesus is God, he says, and that's a fact, Jack. <laughs> I, lo I love that he was just talking to some guy who said Jesus wasn't God but he is, he's God in the flesh he died, he came to this earth became human <clears throat> related to us in his humanity and died on the cross in our place that is so beautiful that God would love us so much that he would do that and so to show you the gospel, I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 2 because I think it, it outlines the gospel very clearly for us and we're just going to quickly move through this but I just want you to have a place you can go <coughs> if you want to describe the gospel to somebody. Ephesians chapter 2 is a great place. <coughs> if you're taking notes, you can write down these verses. Um, but we're going to be looking at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and then also um, some verses in Romans as well. But you can write those down. But just if, if you don't write it down, you know, you can go to Ephesians 2. And it starts out with, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now it says in there probably, he made alive. You'll notice it's in italics. Um, for our purposes, we're going to take that out just because it's not in the original text. It's just there for clarity, not removing something from the Bible. It's just, it, you know, they added that for clarity, but we're going to take it out just to look at it. You'll notice it's italicized, and that's what that means when it's italicized, that it was added for clarity. <clears throat> but it says, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in once you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That paints the picture of where mankind is. Where you are outside of Jesus. That you are following the course of this world. You are a slave of the devil. He is controlling your life, and he is leading you where he wants you to go, and you are just fulfilling the lusts of your flesh and of your mind, and you are in bondage, to sin. Because when man comes into this world, he is a sinner. Now I said this was the good news. That's not good news, is it? You have to have the bad news first, and then you can tell the good news. And so you tell somebody, you are a sinner. Think about it. From the time a baby is born, and it's, it's old enough to where it could rip your arms off, if it was strong enough, it would, wouldn't it? You know, babies have a sin nature. Anybody who has kids knows that, right? You know that kids, you know, the world tells us, it's, it's ironic, the world tells us, psychology tells us, man is basically good. What man? I mean, do you know of anybody who is basically good? I mean, if you look at our own hearts, we realize we're desperately wicked, right? At our core, and, and we are born into this place where we are, <coughs> as it talks about children of wrath. 
And what that means is that we are objects, from birth, we are objects of God's wrath. We are born with a sinful nature. And it's not that God hates us, or God wants to smash us, it's not that at all. It's just that we are not, we are not pleasing to Him because we are contrary to Him in our sin, and He is perfect. And that's a difficult place to be. Can a baby, can a baby be an object of wrath? That's, that's hard for us to get around, you know? We look at our, our children and our babies, and we realize they're snot sometimes, but, I mean, really wrath? And yet, that's just because we're human, and we look at human babies and we have compassion on them. Oh, in fact, the other babies too, you know, we look at puppies and we have compassion on them. And we look at kittens and we have compassion on them because we, we, they're cute, right? And yet, what if your, your dog was, was um, pregnant and was, you're just so excited for the puppies to come, and you, you, you hear, you know, in the morning you hear these yelps and squeals and stuff, and you, you take your kids out there and you're so excited to go see these cute little puppies that were just born. And you, you look out and you see the do your dog and there's something wrong and it's foaming at the mouth. And a bat had got into the little cage as it was, um, you know, getting, giving birth and stuff. And it had bitten the dog and the puppies. And now the puppies have little foam in their mouth and your kids are running toward them. Puppy, puppy, puppy. You're like, no. And you pull your kids back. Because, of course, they have hydrophobia, right? Rabies. And if they bite your children, it will spread to them. And so you're, you're concerned about that. And, and, and you pull your kids back. You love the puppies. But now they're an object of your wrath. You can't allow your children to go near them. You can't go near them because it's dangerous, in a sense. Or think about this. Maybe um, there was a baby born in your home. And you weren't really anticipating it, you didn't know it, but it was born, oh, babies are so cute, aren't they? That little sack of baby spiders that came out from your headboard and, and invaded you across your face as you were sleeping that night. Oh, so precious, right? No, they're an object of your wrath. Oh, no! You know, you kill them because they're, they're hideous. Or a baby mouse that's born in, inside the wall of your house. Actually, not a baby mouse, baby mice. 40 of them. In the little nest in there, all oh, so precious. No, not really, right? <clears throat> because you know what they do. We used to have, we, we lived across the street over here where Jesse and Kathy live now. We used to get catch mice, you guys probably do, catch mice in our garden tub. They would just get in there. Like if a mouse got in the house, it'd get into the garden tub. <clears throat> we'd run around there and couldn't get out. And so I would get a jar and I would catch that mouse and I would take it out um, and I would let it go in the wild. No, I kill it, right? I smash that thing or drown it or something. I, I exact wrath upon that little venomous creature, right? It's disgusting. I didn't, Shannon didn't want to know that. She's like, I don't want to know what you do. One time I smashed one. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, it's, they're, they're an object of my wrath, right? But let's say one, one day, um, Little Joshua here was was coming in. This is just hypothetical. But let's just say Joshua came in and, and I grabbed that mouse and got it in a jar, caught it in a jar, and I put a paper underneath and flipped it upside down. I'm getting ready, my wrath is getting ready to fall on this little guy um, to, to squish him to oblivion. And Joshua comes in, he's like, oh, cute daddy mouse. And he looks at mama and mama's heart changes from disgust to, oh, he is cute. You know, and, and all of a sudden now um, everybody's looking at me with this, he's like, can we keep him? type of a look, and, and instead of going and smashing him like I was intending to do, I'm actually driving to the pet store to buy a little cage and get some shots and some food, and he is, because of my son and his intervention and his love, now all of a sudden this mouse becomes a part of the family, right? Not my original intention, but... That's how God saw us, uh, saw us in verse 4, Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, <clears throat> because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive <coughs> with Christ by grace you have been saved. <clears throat> and of course, we remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, <clears throat> um, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That God gave his son to come into this world, become a man, die upon the cross for our sins because the wages of sin is death. Um, Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. We earn death. 
because of our wickedness. And yet, even though we earn death, God, rich in mercy, sent His Son to die in our place. And Romans 6.23 ends with, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, sin condemns all, uh, God condemns all under sin because of sin. It tells us in Romans 3.10 that it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And Romans 3.23 tells us that for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner by birth, but we can deny that sin nature because of what Jesus did to us, did for us. We can reach out to Him and God accounts His sacrifice on the cross as payment for our debt to God. And when we do that, He gives us eternal life as a free gift. And that's what's beautiful. Notice what it says in, in Ephesians 2.6. It says, And raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in <coughs> all the ages to come, all eternity, He might show, continually showing, the exceeding riches of His grace and kindness towards those of us in Christ Jesus. He is going to, for all eternity, to be showing us the grace that He has for us. It is, it is beyond measure what this gospel has done. It is good news. And then, of course, in verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's, it's God's grace. It means gift. It's His gift to you through faith, meaning I put my trust in Him. No, and that not of yourselves. It means not because you did something for it. It is a gift of God. A gift that you only have to receive. This is, this is why this is such good news. A lot of people look at church and they look at religion and they look at Christianity and they say, I don't want your heavy, <coughs> excuse me, your heavy trip. I don't want to have to you know, be forced to do all the rules. But that's not what it is, is it? No, we, we only can come to God. We can't come to God having earned something, saying, God, I have done a lot of work. You owe me something. All we can do is come to God with our sin in our hands, piled high. Say, God, forgive me a sinner. And He removes our sin when we put our trust in Him and makes us accepted in His beloved. We become accepted by Him because of what He's done. So it's not a gift. It's not <clears throat> uh, works that we've done. This is verse 9. Not works. Not of works, as, <coughs> excuse me, lest anyone should boast. It's not works that save us. And yet, once we are saved, once we are His, He uses us to do good works. So we're not doing works to earn salvation or to earn something, but we do works out of gratefulness for all that He has done for us. It is a pleasure for us to serve Him. Right? And if it's not a pleasure for you to serve Him, then don't. Okay? It's not about it. You know, you need to do more for God. It's about all that He's done for you. And now out of gratitude and out of the fullness of the Spirit in my heart, I want to serve Him. And of course, that's what it says in, in Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship. It, it, the word in the Greek there for workmanship is poema. It means masterpiece. We are His poem. We are His work of art. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in Him. He's prepared them. He has us walk through with them. And He is the one who does the work through us when we do it by faith. And so it's not about striving. It's not about doing more. It's about Jesus working in us to accomplish His will. And so it is, it is, the Christian's attitude should never be, I'm not doing enough. The Christian's attitude should be, Lord, what do you want me to do? Or what are you going to do through me? And to be obedient to God as He opens doors. And that's where we stand right now, is before a large open door as Christians. No different than the open door that was given <clears throat> to the early church. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Excuse me, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I'm dyslexic. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8. Um, Acts <laughs> This is the third service. I told you duct tape, right? Okay, let's pull that duct tape off. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. <clears throat> but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, <clears throat> and to the end of the earth. Um, Jesus gives this to the apostles. Um, he says, wait in Jerusalem. The day of Pentecost is going to come and then you're going to be witnesses from in Jerusalem, and Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. 
and, and God worked with them, and they stayed in Jerusalem and Judea pretty much for the first 12, 13 years. It wasn't until after that that they began to reach out to the Gentiles, and they went to the ends of the earth. And as you know, we've probably been here, we've been here as, as a church for about 13 years, and God has created a base for us here in our Jerusalem. And we're getting ready now to send um, Jesse and Kathy, the Hurdleses, to Homer, Alaska. And perhaps others of you too will go. Maybe soon, maybe later. Um, maybe some of us will go on short-term fishing, I mean mission trips <laughs> to Alaska as well. For mission trips. <coughs> um, and that's exciting. God has opened that door. Next week, Brent Hare will be here from Calvary Chapel, Rome, Italy. A um, good friend of mine. We've been supporting them for the last 13 years. And maybe some of you will join Brent and Hope to help with the work there. Or maybe go on a short-term trip to Rome. Um, I, I think we'll probably do one of those next year, Lord willing. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean that all of us <clears throat> will go to the other side of the world. But some of us will. Some of us will go to the other side of the world. There needs to be those who go, but there also needs to be more who stay behind and send. <clears throat> now, I don't doubt that, some, that God spoke to some of you. While we were watching that video earlier, you were watching that, and something stirred inside of you as it said, God sent a missionary. And you, the idea of hardship and difficulty, and giving, up, giving up conveniences, and laying down your life for the gospel is appealing to you. Maybe that's you. That's not normal. It isn't. If that's you, that's God. We're stirring you, working in you, saying, yeah, you know what? I don't need all that America has to offer. Forget the American dream. I want to go where nobody else has gone, and I want to share the gospel with people at the risk of my own life and my own health. Because that's more important. If God has stirred you that way, then maybe it's time to start praying about, God, what do you want me to do? Others, you, other, others of you are thinking about uh, I can't go. You know, I got too many responsibilities here. God's given me this big ministry here or this responsibility here, but I am stirred by that as well. And I want to help somebody else go. I want to send someone. But to whatever degree, all of us are commanded to go. To go and preach the gospel, to tell a lost and dying world about the only hope of humanity, and that is Jesus Christ. And we can start to do that right here. In fact, we're supposed to start right here. He says, first of all, notice this. <clears throat> in Acts 1, again, I'm just going to pick up the last part of it. He says, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and in the end of the earth. And I want, the remainder of our time, I just want to talk about that particularly, what those three things mean to us as a church. And of course, um, what is our Jerusalem, what is our Judea, Samaria, and what are the uttermost parts of the earth from our perspective. And of course, Jerusalem to us, in our case, is... Emmett, the metropolis of Emmett, Idaho, and Jim County, I suppose you could include in that, um, this thriving community that God has made us a part of. <clears throat> to love this community enough to bring the gospel to this community. And we've been pretty effective at doing that. God is using us to do that. But maybe God is speaking to you specifically and saying, how are you doing that in your sphere of influence? How are you sending the gospel to people? And that is a terrifying thing, I know, for some of you. To think about talking to somebody about Jesus. You know, it would be one of those conversations where you're like, you know, I don't know what to say. You know, and it's just scary. It can be scary talking to people about Jesus. But it really doesn't have to be as scary as we feel that it is. And, and, and of course, you know, reaching out, preaching the gospel, sharing the good news. Um, good news, it can be anything from, you know, a, a detailed gospel presentation to someone, to passing out a track to someone, say, hey, or, or maybe just inviting them to church. You sit with them in church and then afterwards talk to them about whatever, and, you know, answer any questions they might have. Praying for those in your neighborhood friends and family, that God might give, open a door of opportunity for you to speak to them. Um, there's a lady walking down the street. Um, she saw this girl, you know, every day sitting out on her porch, 
that she felt like she really needed to share the gospel with her. Now, this is a little bit uncomfortable for me, but this is what's ha been happening, and I'm not sure exactly why it's happening, but it seems like people from other churches who are elderly are talking to people, they're sharing the gospel with people, and then they're telling them, you need to go to Calvary Chapel. They're not taking them to their own churches, and I'm not sure why, I don't know how I feel about that, it's a little strange, but praise the Lord, you know, I mean, they're sharing the gospel. But a lady came in and she said, I need some pamphlets on your church because I go to this other church, but I want them to come to your church. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> not, not ideal, you know. I, ideally, you want to say, hey, come with me, right? I'll be there with you, um, I, I think. And, and so, you know, those are, those are good things. We can do that being a part of BBS. You realize, as, as they were talking about earlier today, when you reach these, these little kids for Jesus, a lot of times entire families get saved. We've seen that happen again and again, our VBS um, outreaches. And, and then Cherry Festival, of course, and other outreaches. But we also have some pretty amazing tools to reach people in our town. And I want to just share, I want to expand your, your mind a little bit here um, when it comes to how we can reach people. And this isn't going to relate to everybody, but I think that it will probably relate to a lot of you. To see, I have something in my phone right here. It's, it's called a camera. And, and it's... Um, it's now it's looking at all of you, so I want everybody to smile because I just took, with a fisheye lens, I just took a picture of all of you. And I'm going to post that on Facebook. And I want you to go on Facebook. If you have Facebook, I want you to go on Facebook and I want you to tag yourself in that photo. And what's going to happen is all of a sudden your friends are going to see you at church. Oh my goodness, look, they're at church. Okay? Now, one thing that people do in our church a lot, actually, and this is kind of cool, is... People will get on before church. I notice my Facebook kind of explodes with a few posts. Um, getting ready to go to Calvary Chapel, expecting God to speak to me today. You know, can't wait. And then they post it on Facebook, and then they come to church. And then sometimes after church, you see it. Oh, you know, great message or great worship today or whatever. God spoke to me or a quote or something like that, and somebody posts it. You know, I noticed that there's pictures that were taken during church. <gasps> You know, when we were at the pastor's conference, it was kind of crazy. Everybody had their phone out. All of us. I mean, even me, Jason. <clears throat> Jason was um, taking video with his phone. Jesse had his tablet up, and he was taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> during, during service and, you know, during messages, you probably noticed my post. There was pictures of the sermon. You know, somebody's doing, and I, I put, like, a quote or something funny that they said or something like that. And that's just a way to share. You know, maybe during your devotions, you can post something. Some of you do all this. You know, I'm just, this is a little new, so a lot of you. But just to post something that the Lord spoke to you during devotion. And your friends see that. What would happen if every Sunday, every Saturday night, every Sunday, <clears throat> the, the residents of Emmett, their Facebook exploded, or their Twitter, or their Instagram exploded with Jesus. You know, and they see it, and they hear it, and they're thinking, you know, maybe I should go check that out. You know, and, and then they come to Jesus. You know, God, can, he, we can use all of these things, social media, um, to reach people. Um, another thing we have, you can go ahead and put up that first slide <coughs> um, right now. This is what, is it coming up? Maybe. Chris? Uh, hold on, what? What's that? What? Which, uh, is it going? Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> hey, will you go with me to Tower Chapel this Sunday morning at 9 a.m.? Add a comment if you'd like to join us, too. Um, you can, this is what they call a meme, right? And you can download that meme. It's on our website. We have a place that, on About Us. You can go to the bottom. It says Invitation Memes. And you can click on that, download it, and then you post it on your Facebook or post it on somebody's wall or something like that just to invite somebody to church. You realize that they, that they poll people who don't go to church, and 80% of those people said that they would go if somebody would just invite them. 80%. Isn't that crazy? Now, it's not about growing the church or anything. It's about reaching out to people that people might get saved, right? That's, that's what this is about. And so um, <clears throat> things like that are, are ways that we can reach out to people. Now, it, I know you're, some of you are sitting there and like, I don't have a smartphone. I still drive a stick shift that has roll-up windows. Right? I'm not in that world yet. I'm still back in, you know, <clears throat> 1980. And, and that's cool if, if that's you. Um, I'm also having these cards made up, these cool cards, and they will have a <coughs> website on them. But basically it's just going to be an invitation to church. And what I've decided to do is as I get these invitations to church made up, I am personally just making a commitment to the Lord or to myself. And it's not really a, um, a vow of anything. I don't believe in that. But I'm going to try to pass out 25 of those a week. 
And, and I'm going to pass them out to Checker at Albertsons, I'm going to pass them out to people at McDonald's if I go there, or whatever, and, and then I'm, I'm going to take my son down to the park, and I'm going to pass out those to people at the park and talk to them and actually share the gospel with people. Um, and that's kind of fun, you know, just to, to, you know, for those of you who aren't into that. Maybe you can just grab one and give one to your neighbor or something like that. But just praying that God would give you an open door. I'm just giving you some practical things here. I'm not telling you you have to do any of this stuff, but just to pray about what God would have you do. Um, and so that's how we reach our Jerusalem, in a sense. You know, those are just some suggestions on how we might do that. But then there's Judea and Samaria. And when we think of Judea and Samaria, we're probably thinking of outside of Jim County. So we're talking Treasure Valley on up to the entire United States. People who are somewhat our culture and speak the same language that we do. Right? And so that's, that's kind of our, our Judea and Samaria within our country. And we, we, we've been, as a, as a church, we have been doing this already. This is something that we've done, you know, and we do that through our radio ministry. And that's one of the ways we do it. We do it through radio ministry. We have, we have podcasts, of course, that go over all the world. We have over a thousand hits on our podcast every, every month, or no, every week. A thousand hits a week on our podcast. And so people are listening to that. Um, beyond that, we have a radio ministry um, in the Treasure Valley. We have two time slots that we're on, and they actually put us on in Pocatello as well. So now we're, we're reaching out to Pocatello. And then um, the guy up in Grangeville said, hey, I want to put you on my station. Only 50 bucks a month. And we're like, can't pass that up. So now we're in Grangeville, Pullman, and Moscow. And over a, a, about 200,000 people or plus in those areas that our radio program is reaching out to and making an impact in those areas. <coughs> but, but not just that, you know, we're, we're talking about um, sending others on domestic missions. You know, of course, Christina just went to, um, with YWAM, just went um, over to Boise to reach out to refugees as well as to homeless people in the park and stuff. It impacted her life, Randy told me about it last night. That is so cool. And, and, you know, some of you contributed to help her go do that. Um, get trained with YWAM and everything to do that. And others um, from our church, you know, go over to Boise and they preach, you know, the gospel over on Boise Center on the Square. Um, and that's all kinds of fun. You know, they, they go and do those types of things. And domestic missions where we go and help out, do an outreach for another church somewhere. Things we've done like that in the past. Um, but also sending people church planting. And that's what we're doing with the Hurlis um, we pull up the next slide, Chris, if you're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? That's an aircraft carrier, yeah. Um, pretty proud, USS Ronald Reagan, which we all love. Um, this is a cool boat, is it not? And, and what is the purpose of that boat? Okay. Yeah? And, and how does it do that? How does it keep peace and what does it take from place to place? Airplanes. Aircraft, right? Yeah. It takes aircraft and pilots. <coughs> That's the purpose of this, this huge boat, is to carry aircraft to wherever the mission needs to be accomplished to keep the peace in the world and to protect the United States of America, which we love, right? And it's awesome. We have it. And so uh, this aircraft carrier um, exists solely to carry those pilots and those planes to wherever it is that the mission is going to be, and it sends them from there. Will you give me the next slide, Chris? Your way. There, there is 5,700 plus people on that boat. There is everything from dishwashers to Marines in the bottom of the boat in case it gets attacked so they can come out and defend the boat. There are um, people who load um, weapons onto the planes. There are people who taxi the air aircraft. There are people who maintain the aircraft, mechanics who maintain the aircraft. There are, there's actually a, um, a captain of the ship and crew to the ship. There are people who keep the runway clean. There are people who um, do the laundry. There are doctors and nurses. There are all kinds of people that work on this ship to serve 113 pilots, even people who, who create the missions and tell the pilots where they're supposed to fly and what they're supposed to do, whether it's reconnaissance or um, defense or whatever, um, that they make those plans and then those pilots get on up to 90 planes. Now, we've got, when there's 90 planes on the USS Ronald Reagan, it is packed full. I mean, they, could, they barely have runway 
to get a plane down the runway and shoot it off into the sky, barely, because it, I mean, it is like nose to nose, side to side, stacked airplanes. They can get up to 90 on there, but usually there's probably only 40 to 60 aircraft on that airplane, or on that aircraft carrier at any given time. And all of those people serve so those few can accomplish a mission. And so too it is for us. We have a church family here. Um, there's probably about 400 people who call this church their home. In the three services, we usually have about 300 per Sunday in the three services. Even during the summer, we've had um, up to that many, which is, is, is a pretty good base for us to be able to send out a few people who want to make a difference in another location. Now, here's the thing about that. This is what's interesting. God has shown to Jesse and Kathy that... He wants them to go to Homer, Alaska. He's provided uh, miracles. He's done miracles to prove to them that he wants them to go there. You know, and they, they have multiple proofs. In fact, Jesse needs more proofs than most people. And so God has graciously just showered it upon. I mean, he, he, the only thing he has not done is scream from a megaphone in the sky, which God doesn't need a megaphone, but he could have used one and said, Jesse, go! He could have. And he pretty much did that, um, but without a megaphone. <coughs> and so they're going to go. And they do not need us because they have God, right? I mean, that, that we, we, we don't even have to support them financially. We could just say, um, see you later, and, and send them out. And they could go, and, and God would use them in Alaska. But we have an opportunity as a church family to send them, which I think is even better. See, when Paul was on his missionary journeys, he didn't, he didn't have anybody saying, you know, hey, we're, you know, he didn't go and raise support or anything like that for himself. All he did was he went when God told him to go. But in Philippi, there was people there in Philippi who supported Paul. They sent money to him. And, he, and he, he says that in the book of Philippians. He's like, you sent aid to me once and again to meet my necessities. And he says, not that I speak concerning a gift, but in verse 17 he says, I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. You see, if you partner with them to go to Alaska and they go there and reach people for Jesus, then you share in that ministry with them. You become a part of that ministry and, and people get saved because of your partnership with them in the gospel. When Shannon and I came here, um, we didn't really have any support. Of course, we weren't coming very far. We, we did it without support. So Shannon worked a full-time job. I worked a full-time job. And it made the work go a little bit slower. But we felt it was important to work to do the ministry because we didn't want to take anything from the ministry that was just getting going. We wanted to put all that money back into the ministry to reach more people. And, and I think that's important. Jesse isn't going. Jesse and Kathy, they're not going to pay up. <laughs> they're going to Homer. It's going to cost about $10,000 just for them to move there. That's a huge step for them. And then just living expenses while they get there. Jesse will probably have to get a job. But wouldn't it be awesome if he could go up there and, and we're going to give him his salary for six months at least. You know, we'll, we're praying about that. You know, and he's, we give him a house too, but we're not going to be able to give him that. You know, you can't send the house up there with him. So he's going to get his salary that he got. So, you know, he's going to be a little bit short when he gets there. And, and yet God's going to provide for him. But wouldn't it be cool if we as a church family would send them? I love what Paul said to Gaius as he wrote in, or excuse me, John said to Gaius in 3 John um, chapter 1. There's only one chapter. But 3 John verse 5, Paul says this to Gaius. He says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness to our love before the church. If you send them forward in their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well because they went forth in his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that they may be fellow workers for the truth. So what he's saying is he says, when you send people, you send them in a manner worthy of God. And that you don't, um, you don't send them so, so that they have to you know, try to take money from people that they're trying to minister to. Now, if time will come when Jesse and Kathy get the church going, and they'll be able to start to draw a salary from that church, God, God willing. But at the beginning, they don't want to go up there and, and feel like they have to live off the money that, they're, that are being brought in by tithes and offerings. They want to use that money 
to further the gospel. But wouldn't it be awesome if they were to be able to go up there and, and Jesse wouldn't have to be overwhelmed with a full-time job and they could actually serve the Lord and we could plant a church that could get started strong in the first place. You know, Jesse worked for this church for two years without any salary. I didn't even know what to do about it. He kept coming to work. I was like, man, I can't pay you. He's like, I know. God told me to come here and work. So he did. He worked for two years without getting paid a dime. And before that, he served in ministry. You know, he served in ministry for two years before that, before he was on staff, if you call it that, when you just show up for work. And, and I couldn't fire him because he's working for free. I mean, what do you do, right? And so finally, I, you know, I'm scraping together the elders. I'm like, I, you know, we need to pay this guy. And so we... We adjusted some things, and we were able to start giving Jesse a little bit. And, and you know, now he gets a, a salary, not a huge salary. None of us are getting wealthy, but, you know, God um, provides. And, and so, um, you know, the way he's, he's served us here, you know, it would be awesome to be able to serve them in that. And so that's, that's, one of, that's how we reach our Judea and Samaria, and then, of course, the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, next week, Brent Harrell will be here to share more about that, what God is doing in Rome, Italy. Brian Fouts will be here in August to share with us about what's going on in the streets of Romania. It's exciting. Our VBS, I actually was talking to Crystal about it just a few days ago. Our VBS is going to be raising money. The kids will be raising money so that the Stanzels in Pex Hungry, who Balaj has been here and spoken, Leah, of course, is Dwayne's sister, Dwayne Tucker's sister, um, who's married to the pastor at Calvary Chapel, Pex. I'm pronouncing that wrong, but Pex Hungry. Um, they're going to be, they do outreaches to the children in their neighborhood, so our VBS kids are going to be raising money so that they can do their outreaches. Isn't that cool? And so all these things, it's, it's going to, to reach out to the ends of the earth, and that's what we do. As some of you have supported India. Well, our church has supported India. Many of, of you have participated in Runs for Heaven's Gate, um, which supports the AIDS victims who are, are taken in in India. You know, all these things... Um, to do that. And so as the, as the years go on, you know, we're going to be planning more short-term mission trips maybe next year. I'll probably go to India before 2016 because that's when my visa expires, so I've got to probably get there before that happens at least one more time. Um, some of us will be going on those mission trips to Alaska with the Herlises or Europe or Eastern Europe or India or somewhere. But, but as we pray about that, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do we have to be obedient to Him, whether it's just staying home and praying and seeking God or maybe sending some support or maybe sending letters of encouragement, whatever it might be, this is the open door that God has given us as a church. He has opened these doors that we might be able to walk through them and to see what God does. You know, that's, that's the beautiful thing about this. It's just about seeing what God does and being a part of what He's doing. We don't have to be a part of it. I'm not putting pressure on anybody to give to missions or to go on missions. And you don't have to do that. You know, what I want you to do, what I want you to do, what I am putting pressure on you to do, is to get on your knees and say, God, what do you want me to do? That's it. That's how simple it is. God, what do you want me to do? And then simply be obedient to that. And you'll see that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think as you just obey. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We pray that you would just use um, our fellowship to accomplish your purposes for, for this place, Lord, here in Emmett, Idaho, and beyond, to Homer, Alaska, to the Treasure Valley, to around the world, to India, to Rome, to Pex Hungary, to these places where people are dying and in need of the gospel of peace. Lord, we have good news to share. And I pray that you would provide those opportunities for us to share the good news. But as you say in your word, how will they go? Or how will they hear unless there's a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Lord, I pray that you would put it on our heart, Lord, as a church, what you want us to do to send people that we might further your work, not only here in Emmett, but around the world that you would use this little fellowship for your glory, for your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.